So Rob, I love your story on how you got into the critical infrastructure business. To say it's uncommon would be um, the understatement. So can you just help us to understand how you got involved in the, in this business? Yeah, absolutely. First off, David, thanks a lot for having me on this uh, podcast. I'm super excited to be here. Um, my story really began more than 30 years ago, um, and it began with an origin in manufacturing. I uh, I used to work for my father, who's a manufacturing entrepreneur, and I would program these real-time production feedback systems on manufacturing shop floors. And it was amazing to me. I, I still remember this moment where um, a 45 foot tall furnace was fixed by a five foot tall man because <laughs> the furnace could speak to him and tell him basically, hey, this is the problem with me, you know, right. like this is the issue. It was just amazing to me how productive that facility was with just three or four people running it because they had real time production feedback that told them where the problems were and they didn't have to go hunt for problems. So, you know, when people talk about that stat that manufacturing has had productivity gains in the last two decades, I saw that in real life. And at the age of four, five, six, seven, you're very impressionable. And I just fell in love with the idea that machines could talk to us. Mm. Um, so that kind of became my love affair with cyber physical systems, computer vision in particular. That's how I got introduced to computer vision. That led me to the second chapter of my life, which was using computer vision uh, to do all kinds of cool things, mm -hmm. um, but build robots and all that stuff. And the third chapter of my life has been building Doxel, where I brought those first two chapters together, bringing the productivity gains of manufacturing with real-time production feedback to construction using computer vision. Mm -hmm. And it's been a heck of a ride at Doxel, and it, this is just the start with the pace we're going. So um, I could tell from your accent, you're probably from the Midwest. So you, you're, you're watching your dad in the manufacturing business. You see these things. Um, you, I don't want to steal your thunder. I want you to use the phrase that I heard you say. But I remember when you were communicating um, once before in this juxtaposition of this complex operation that was hampered by well why don't you why don't you tell this story why don't you help us to understand yeah that? so in fact uh, um, so i grew up in india and my dad's um uh, my dad's first facility which he uh, which he was trying to build was actually delivered two years late hmm. and the production of the facility was amazing i mean it would run 24 7 and this is by the way the, this is the case with manufacturing even today um in in several parts of the world including right here in the united states the operation of the facility is phenomenal. It runs 24 seven, 365 days a year. Um, and downtime is counted in seconds sometimes, sometimes in minutes, but almost never in days or weeks. Whereas in construction, um, oftentimes delays um, can be days or weeks long. And the core reason why is because there are so many talented folks in the construction industry, but they have to go hunt for problems. Mm. And they're very good at hunting for problems. Don't get me wrong. They're also very good at solving problems, but they spend about 25 to 40% of their time a week on hunting for problems. Mm. Whereas their counterparts in manufacturing spend 100% of their time on solving problems. Mm. And that's the core thesis behind what we've built here at Doxel. Um, we want to bring construction into an era where it operates as productively or even more productively than manufacturing because the folks in this industry are freaking talented. Right. And we want to give them the tools with which they can focus almost entirely on action, not on data collection, <laughs> right. which isn't funny either. <laughs> right. uh, one of the things I remember about your story that really came through was in that, in that first build that you, at least the one you were talking about, was the real financial risk um, if we don't get this thing built, in, like we've got all of our, all of our investment is in this thing. Everything we've got is in this thing and we need it. We're certain we need it to be up in time. We're certain that once we get it operational, we'll be good because that's our field of expertise. 
But these delays aren't just inconvenient. It could be a catastrophe for um, us personally. A hundred percent. And I mean, we laugh about it now looking back because it was so long ago. <laughs> um, but it, it was a real kind of punch in the face, if you will. And I was five and five-year-olds pick up on a lot of things. Right. <laughs> They're very perceptive. I was five and it really brought home to me that... Um, lives and livelihoods can be impacted uh, with this thing called business, with this right. thing called construction. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and it just, it helped me empathize a lot with, um, with what folks in this industry face every day. And I mean, if you, if, you, if you look at the mental health challenges in this industry, I had a superintendent send me a text and I almost cried when I read it. Mm. He said, your product is gonna change this industry not only is this going to change how we do business, it's going to change the lives inside of it. Mm. This thing is going to save lives. And I called him and I said, we're doing production tracking. Right. How does that save lives? And he's just like, it takes a lot of the stress off in finding problems in the last minute because we can be proactive and solve those problems early. Um, and I really empathized with that because it brought back those memories uh, early on. But um, yeah, I certainly don't want to make the focus myself in the conversation conversation but um but yeah i mean that's why this this industry matters to me so much and that's why what we're building is very near and dear to my heart and is my life so let's talk about that a little bit you and i agree some of the most talented uh intellectually brilliant people we know are in the field building critical infrastructure. I mean, I, I argue many times that the ideas of the whole world live in a data center. And if you want to be connected to the modern economy, you have to be connected in some way to uh, a data center. I was reading a uh, report not long ago, I think it's the Brookings Institute that said, said at the time of that post report, which is pretty recent, uh, easily a third of the world is still not connected to the internet and easily half of the world is not connected to broadband. So we're trying to build this infrastructure, not just in response to whatever is going on in the hype cycle today, but just period. You want to you raise people out of poverty? You connect them to the modern economy. In order to connect them to the modern economy, you got to build infrastructure. So we've got these talented people out there. We're trying to find as many of them as we can um, to be part of the world. And then when you compound that with um, a lot of the people that were coming into the business don't have a lot of experience in our business. They're smart. We're OJTing them. So when you talk about this inefficiency or this problem, before we get into specifically how Docs was solving it, what is it, the problems that are occupying as much as 40% or more of the time of these um, folks in the field? And, and what is it that you're observing now that you've been part of it for a while? Yeah, that, and I'm, I'm and I'm glad that you asked that question because um, candidly, I sometimes feel like the folks in the construction industry are so talented that they made this extremely complex thing seem easy to do, right? Or seem viable to do. And I'm in a construction trailer right now. I spend a lot of time in the field with the folks I serve, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to do that. And I'd like to zoom out for a quick second because I know that your podcast has lots of listeners, maybe in finance, maybe in software, That's some right. in construction. Why does construction even matter, right? <clears throat> yeah. Why does construction matter in data center, in the data center sector? Well, construction matters in a 30 year life cycle of a data center. Construction is just one year. So why does construction matter? Well, because for that one year, that is a liability. Mm -hmm. The data center is a liability at that in that period of time because it's pulling money out it becomes an asset only once construction is finished. Right. That's why construction matters. And when it's finished, that data center, depending on the size, can be generating millions of dollars a week. It can be generating tens of millions a week, depending on the size. So we're talking about pretty big numbers here. And construction matters because even till today, 30% of construction work is rework, mm. right? And there's a massive, massive labor shortage in the industry, um, which is baked into these schedules, which is baked into these budgets. And it's baked in because it's the pragmatic thing to do. That's the way the last thousand projects have gone. So why shouldn't the next thousand go that way? Um, so to jump a little bit deeper into that, um, why does this rework happen, right? Rework and labor shortage. That's what I keep hearing 
from folks in this industry. Um, apart from some other some other challenges, but I keep hearing rework and labor shortage quite frequently. Um, let's talk a little bit about labor shortage to begin with, right? So just to shed some light um, for folks outside of construction, uh, the Association of General Contractors just published a report. They've surveyed 1,400 contractors across the country. 85% of those contractors said that they're predicting that in 2024, they're not going to be able to fill craft worker positions, right? Actually, sorry, let me correct that. 85% said they don't have position, they, they have open positions right now. 88%, mm. even higher than that, said they're not going to be able to fill those positions in 2024, right? So you're talking about a pretty serious issue that can stall these amazing problems of success that we have in the data center industry, where there's demand raining down from the sky. Well, how are we going to go build these things? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I hear from folks in the field, superintendents especially, is how do I extract the most out of my labor? Mm -hmm. Right? How do I keep them the most productive? How do I keep the mechanical subcontractor from stepping on the toes of the plumbing subcontractor? Mm -hmm. How do I coordinate these folks better? The second thing that I hear about is rework, right? Uh, and I want to talk about this with a quick example. <clears throat> um, a typical data center facility has millions and millions of components, and a single component being installed at the wrong place at the wrong time can cause a two to four week delay. So a quick example, um, you know, and we see this all, all the time, you could have a one or a two foot piece of pipe that's installed in wall, and you could have a situation where someone forgets to install it or doesn't install it. And who's gonna catch a one foot piece of pipe in a walk? Right. Right. And then, you know, someone comes in, covers it up, and there you go, you discover it two weeks later, or you discover it a couple of months later, and then you've got to rip everything out and start from scratch, and there you go, that's a two week delay. So 30% of the work that's done, it's called rework. Mm -hmm. You're reworking something. 30% of the work that's done is rework, right? It's just the, the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what we hear folks in the field want to use technology to beat and to challenge because, you know, as you know, they say necessity is the mother of innovation. Mm -hmm. And there's a necessity in the data center industry to capture all this demand. It's... So how did you how did you get exposed coming from seeing the manufacturing process or the uh, the man, building the manufacturing process? How did you get exposed to uh, critical infrastructure and data centers? Well, I we when we began, in fact, um, when we began Doxel, uh, our thesis was complex facilities which have heavy MEP have massive uh, massive potential for mm -hmm. delays. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I saw that in manufacturing. Right. And it would always happen during mechanical, electrical plumbing. The reason why is because you have several trades who are in there at once. Sometimes you have 600 electricians on site. Mm -hmm. Right. 100 mechanical folks on site, so on and so forth. Um, and when you think about that, the facilities that are the, some of the facilities that are the most complex are data centers, healthcare, electric vehicle and manufacturing, um, life sciences facilities. So, you know, that's how we got into it. So it makes sense. Come to the critical infrastructure world and say, look, I've, I see these things and I want to help solve these problems. When you imagine doing that, what's the idea or the technology that you want to bring to the conversation to solve the problems? Like, what did you start identifying beyond, you know, if we, if we tease out rework and labor, what are the areas that you felt like, man, I... I think I got a way to help solve this problem. And then let's talk about what it is that you're bringing to the table to actually help solve it. Yeah, no, and let's talk about that. So okay. the first thing that we did was, um, fundamentally our goal was deliver facilities faster, which of course, in this period of time with everything that's going on in the data center sector, as well as other sectors <clears throat> is super important and massive, massive opportunities get unlocked with that. Right. Double click on that. All right, how do we deliver facilities faster when we beat the labor shortage by helping making labor, by helping make labor more productive? And we beat rework by making sure that decision makers in the field know what's happening all the time. Right. And, and by the way, let me interrupt there for one second, because sure. as you're as I'm thinking about this, we used to build a data center, I don't know, every other year. Now we're building five a year. 
There you go. And our data centers that we used to build were 50, 80 megawatts. Now I'm building campuses of 1,000, 1,200, 1,400 megawatts, and I'm sure even larger. So you're entering into a space that, at least for the 30 years of your experience, has had trouble hitting targets accurately. And now you add speed and scale, unprecedented speed and scale. It's got to compound the challenges. Big yeah. Big time, because the facilities are getting more complex. They're getting more dynamic because there's so many changes happening with GPUs. And that's having downstream effects on the construction. So going back to rework and labor shortage, <clears throat> but the first thing that we learned was we started with the customer's problems. And what we heard from decision makers in the field who solve these problems on a day-to-day -day basis was details matter. Mm. One foot piece of pipe, two foot piece of pipe, you know, one foot piece of ductwork, this support there, that support there. It's like a Swiss watch. Mm. It needs to be perfect mm -hmm. in order for it to be on schedule. That's the first thing we learned. Details mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. The second thing we learned was that decision makers in the field have very, very little time. And, you know, I was telling you offline that things like Gantt charts and, you know, difficult to read information is less powerful than something visual. Right. So that's the second thing that we learned, that visual communication, especially among the trades, is big time. They love blueprints, right? right? They love getting status reports on blueprints, like, like, like a scene from Minority Report, <laughs> where everything's pulled up and you're like, right. what's going on? I need situational awareness. They love visual. Right. And the third thing that we learned was, you know, we're super busy. We need solutions that are fast to implement. We're not going to spend even a month implementing a solution, right? And I love that um, I love that clarity that we heard from the field. Um, so how do we go solve this problem? Because that's, you know, you asked me how we go solve this problem. Well, we solve this problem with Doxel. Um, and Doxel is artificial intelligence software that uses cameras to automate progress tracking and construction. Okay. That basically enables general contractors to nip problems in the bud and stop delays from ever happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps owners gain a very high level of visibility into where their project is today and where it's headed in the future. So it, it gives them predictability so that they can monetize that asset that they're building, right? Mm -hmm. As quickly as possible. Um, so just a couple of examples to kind of bring it all home, right? Mm -hmm. So I talked about details matter. Mm -hmm. um, because of that, Doxel is comprehensive. We track all trades. We track 80 plus stages of construction down to the component level. If a support is not installed, Doxel will catch it and say, don't let the next trade in because you're going to lose a bunch of time mm. on this, right? Um, the second thing I mentioned to you was it needs to be simple and visual. So that's a big part of what we do. Mm. What we've literally done is we've taken the age old technique of color coding blueprints, which is done manually. And we allow uh, Doxel's AI to use camera imagery to generate a view that's just like that. Um, and the third thing that we've done really is our software gets implemented in two weeks. The way it works is folks send us their BIM, folks send us their schedule. In two weeks, they go out there, they walk the job site just like they normally would with a 360 camera on their hard hat. Our software goes boop, 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 bada bing, bada boom, and they have a report in 24 to 48 hours. Mm. And that's it. From there on, they typically we see that superintendents and subcontractors trades start using that in their weekly coordination meetings. Um, and if we do our job well, which I like to think we do, uh, it usually leads to roughly a 10 to 11% schedule acceleration um, in a typical data center facility. I heard somebody say not long ago, they were talking about, it wasn't in the rework idea, but it was, it, it rings similar, which is they were talking about trying to be more efficient. So the conversation was a sustainability conversation around waste and inefficiency. And they were making these points. We usually try to deliver more than is asked for because we expect there's going to be rework. We expect that there's going to be um, interruptions and in we don't know where or to what degree, but getting from our manufacturing facility to this site. Like there's for a variety of reasons, we we provide this extra stuff. Not only that, it's very difficult to understand what extra we might have at a different site so that I can get the extra 
that may work if it's just sort of a general duck. Now, some things, many things are very purpose specific, but there's enough of this, you know, general material that can be redeployed. And as you're describing this, I'm imagining that um, we've talked primarily from a perspective of as I build and as I'm installing, but shoot, if I could see on the yard what's coming in, uh, what does my inventory levels look like? And I've got the ability to, to you know, this intelligence has the ability to uh, evaluate that and get me an inventory report or whatever that's got to be, if not available now, um, it, it's got to be beneficial not just to the GC but to the GC suppliers. A hundred percent. So a quick, a quick example on that. Essentially, you're talking about better management of resources right. across a region or across several projects to get, you know, the optimal outcome for as many projects as possible, right? Because right. there's full trading portfolio. A quick story on that, if mm. if it helps. Yeah. So we had a, a customer who um, was using Doxel to track production. Um, you know, they, they did their weekly walks and the software would tell them this is where things were off. And um, the superintendent noticed this trend, right? He saw this dotted line on Doxel's dashboard, which was what his schedule was supposed to be. And he began to see that the actual production was beginning to dip. Mm. He said, huh, let me look a little bit deeper into that. Uh, and we have this calculator inside our tool, which allows them to kind of pump in how much manpower do I have? Where am I going to be if I keep this manpower the same? Like a very simple version of scenario modeling, not to make it sound scary. Mm -hmm. So he did that. And um, the next thing the next thing we know, he's calling our customer service team and he's saying, your software is saying that we're going to be three weeks behind if I don't take double our crew size. Um, are you guys sure that's correct? And you know, we ran him through and we said, we're dead sure that that's correct. So he has this conversation with uh, the trade and it turned out to be the insulation trade that was actually running behind schedule. Mm -hmm. um, and he used our data to essentially um, uh, get the trade to double their crew size. And it turned out the trade had that crew available on a different project, which was also labor constrained, mm -hmm. but was doing much better on schedule, was a little bit ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm. So it just nailed home how high priority it is when he showed that prediction from Doxel saying, we're going to be three weeks behind. Could you please double your crew size? Mm. And the trade doubled the crew size and they averted that three week delay yeah. as a result of the software nailing home just how critical that really is. Uh, to your point about sharing resources, right? Like this trade pulled, the, pulled his crews in from the other project. They got it all done and they averted that delay in time. Yeah. Um, and the other project went okay as well. It was already a little bit ahead of schedule and it landed up just about treading water making schedule. So it was a good outcome for both projects as a result of that shared awareness across those projects. Um, so I think that's pretty inspiring and that's an example of what removing that information asymmetry can actually do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what adds up to schedule acceleration with tools like ours. What, is, what I love about that foundationally, even if they didn't have the crew available, that supervisor now understands there, there's a there's a concept. Uh, so I, long, long, many pounds ago, I was a uh, combat infantry guy. And one of the things that they used to talk to us a lot about, I never had to go to combat, thank goodness. I was an airborne guy, but <clears throat> they talk a lot of, to us about um, what they call commander's intent. And that's where a commander in the business world, a leader, articulates, this is our mission. The United States, I'm sure all militaries are this. We have a mission that we have to accomplish and we have troop welfare that we have to take care of. If we lose all our troops, doesn't do us any good. If we can't accomplish the mission, doesn't do us any good. And so we need to accomplish the mission and take care of our troops. And why that's important is so that when you get fog of war or chaos, I know what role I need to do to accomplish those two things. Uh, take care of my the people around me, safety on a job site or whatever, and accomplish the mission. Where am I at in the status of this mission? So as you described that story, I'm imagining at least that supervisor knew in this fog of war, I can get some clarity. Not only is my schedule in jeopardy, but here's specifically where it is. And so now I know how to take action. 
Now, if the crew hadn't been available, at least you can articulate to whomever you need to, your leadership, the people financing, the other trades that may be impacted by that delay, whatever, so you're not compounding a problem. I have more visibility into my fog of business or fog of construction. Um, hopefully there's no war on the construction site. Although that would be interesting. It'd be like the dwarves against the hobbits against the elves, and <laughs> depending upon which ones, the battle of the five armies. But, um, but it, it inspires confidence in a soup who's got probably more than, you know, all of these different things kind of moving while you're trying to f assemble a fully operational Death Star to know this, here's a situation awareness so I can take accurate action, not just communicate it, but then take action or pause action as I need to. A hundred percent. And really, when you think about, when you put yourself in the boots of a superintendent, um, they're trying to focus the team's attention on that needle in the haystack that they know deserves attention. Mm -hmm. um, and if they focus on that needle in the haystack, which is hard to do, by the way, because number one, you've got to convince the team that that needle matters. Number two, you may be constrained even to fix that one, to, to, to solve that one needle in the haystack problem. Right. But if they do that <clears throat> systematically, um, and I've seen talented superintendents do this time and time again, uh, they repeatedly deliver jobs on schedule. Mm. Um, and they repeatedly develop a reputation for being able to beat schedules. Mm. Right? Um, so what Doxel really does is give superintendents like that superhuman strength to find that needle in the haystack and to give them the tools to communicate with their teams that that needle in the haystack truly matters, mm. right? Like that three week delay. Um, and it's so much more powerful to say, we're gonna have a three week delay to substantial completion date than to say, we're behind, let's get ahead. We're behind, let's get ahead. Well, we're behind on everything or we're behind on a lot of things. What do we focus on? Well, no, let's focus on this thing because this yeah. is on the critical path and it's right. three weeks behind. So that's what, that's what really matters. That's what data helps accomplish. So here comes the skeptic me. I have, I've been doing this for a long time in, in IT, in data centers, whatever. And I cannot tell you how many times in the past two years and this, by the way, is not an infomercial for Doxel. I've just heard you speak, and I think your story is amazing and incredible. Um, and I know I'm not the only one in our industry. So here's my question. I know a lot of people in the trades. And there is, um, there is a bias, at some of it, you know, hard won, that um, either – you're, a tool won't do what it's promising to do, or it's much, much more complicated to implement than what I've got going now, or it will be disruptive, or it will be uh, cost prohibitive, or some combination of things where they just feel like a notepad with a highlighter is better. I don't have to explain it to all of these people. I don't have to introduce a foreign concept. There's no three extra steps. Like I can rely on muscle memory to do it. How do you show up and persuade? And I presume, I guess, maybe that's the wrong presumption. Do you only work with certain, um, like, do you work with owners and operators like us? Or do you, um, you, you, you know, come one, come all? Who, who is it that you approach? And then the second part of my question would be, you know, this, um, I've, th I've heard promises in the past of tools enabling my life. And as often as not, if not more often, they introduce complexity. They never, not only fully realize, but they don't fully develop into the solution I hoped for. So can you help us understand how it is whether it's Doxel specific, but just in general, this is the foundation that tools like mine need or bring to the party so that they'll be effective, not just in their promised output, but the implementation of it. Yeah, it's such a pragmatic question. Um, and um, sadly, I don't hear enough folks ask that question. Mm. Um, that word you use, pragmatic, the word on implementation, right? right. It makes, a, makes a big difference. Um, I'll answer your questions and I've got them noted down, but I'd like to take a little bit of a zoomed out view and share a little bit about the trends that have led to trades feeling like this over the okay. last decade. That, sure. Does that sound like something? Yeah, do it. 
So let's let's zoom out for a second, right? If you think about um, 2008, 2009, 2010, there were two things that were significant that happened for construction technology. The first thing was the introduction of the mobile smartphone, which uh, unleashed all of this technology adoption by the field. Um, and you know the folks at uh, Procore and Autodesk and Aconex and Fieldwire and PlanGrid have done an absolutely heck of a job in enabling folks in the field with smartphones, smart devices to unlock technology and the value of technology for them. Okay, so that's the first trend that kind of took place. Um, and those were those are amazing success stories. The second trend that took place was uh, the world and definitely the United States was coming out of a recession and we took interest rates down to zero. And that led to this environment where money was free. Um, what did that do? Well, what that did was it um, it was so inspiring what technology could do that candidly, I think it developed some bad habits in the industry. Uh, and this is not just construction. This is yeah. like manufacturing, agriculture, no matter where you look, insurance, it developed some bad habits in the industry uh, of trying to throw money at problems that were amazing visions, but that perhaps were not pragmatic to implement. Right. And what's happening now is a very healthy correction, which I think over the course of the next decade is going to be beautiful to watch, experience, and see. And that correction is because interest rates are going back up, folks are getting pragmatic again mm -hmm. and saying, hey, hold on. All that sounds great on a slide deck, but how fast is it going to be to implement? Because I can't give you a month to do it. Mm -hmm. How many resources will it need? Because I don't have enough VDC and scheduling folks <clears throat> to model the universe. <laughs> And how quickly is my team going to be able to adopt this? Because mm -hmm. if we're changing their workflow just a smidge, that's not good enough because mm -hmm. they're busy getting the job done and we're trying to capture this amazing demand that we're seeing, especially in the data center sector. And that's led to kind of separating the wheat from the chaff mm -hmm. where the technology tools that are fast to implement, simple to use, and that don't require any resources from the, the customer side to implement are the ones that get adopted, um, and the others, uh, you know, don't. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's a very healthy trend that's going to lead to over the course of the next decade, trades loving um, technology. Right mm -hmm. again, uh, I mean, I remember about seven or eight years ago, I walked into a construction site and I met a superintendent, and he said, "I love Plan Grid because I have to hit one button to get to where I want to be." Mm -hmm. Right, and Great tools inspire that sentiment, inspire that feeling. Um, and that's what we see with Doxel as well, because it's visual and it's simple. It's, it's uh, we require no resources from the customer to implement it. And we implement in two weeks um, entirely on our own. Now, your question was, who do we approach? Um, so oftentimes we approach the general contractor. Um, oftentimes we approach the owner, but sooner or later we see both of them meeting, which is mm -hmm. great. And we see them working on um, uh, considering our solution together. And there's value for both sides. Um, so, so that's what we typically see. Owners want to de-risk their project and give general contractors the tools they need. General contractors want tools that make construction fun again. <laughs> Let them focus on action, not on data collection. So they're all for it. Um, and in terms of proof points, um, you know what we do these days is uh, we offer customer references. We just say, look, Here's an hour long meeting. We'll show you everything we've got. We'll talk to you about case studies where customers have been able to attain value. And we'd love to put you on the phone with customer references if this feels like a good fit. So my advice to anyone who's in innovation listening to this is if you're getting serious about a technology, um, ask your vendor, you know, do you have customer references that I could talk to? Because mm -hmm. uh, that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate proof of whether mm -hmm. the tech works or not. And it's a healthy thing to do that. Yeah. Uh, earlier, uh, you were talking about pragmatic. I think that's a very pragmatic way to do it. So when you when you actually um, deploy, you mentioned the cameras before. Is, is there something that you put in the people in the? I mean, are they just integrating with their cell phone? Or are they? Um, are you are you supplementing something that they've already been doing? What is it? I don't want you to share all your secret sauce, but is it? Look, here's the. You know, we put a tool in their hands, or they check in, or how does the 
What, what would it look like if we were to go to a job site that had something like this being used, we'd be able to recognize what they're using? Yeah, it's a lot actually like using Uber, um, oh. where the way that someone uses uh, the product is um, they can buy a camera that we recommend, a 360 camera from Best Buy or from whatever their right. electronics store is. Um, or our team ships them one and um, they connect that to their smartphone with our app on it. So Doxel's got a mobile app. They download the app. It connects to the camera. It guides them through step by step, just like something like Uber does. Mm -hmm. And once that done, once that's done, really it, it supplements something that they're already doing, which is walking the site. And typically you have field engineers and project engineers who are new to the industry who are getting trained up who are walking the site several times, who are tech adoptive, um, and they just have this little helper on their hard hat, which is a 360 camera, very lightweight, and they walk like they normally would. You know, They just walk the site like they normally would. All, our software does everything else. Literally, all they have to do is allow this thing to piggyback on their walk. Mm -hmm. they walk the site typically um, um, once or twice a week for Doxel. Mm -hmm. And um, they come back to the trailer, the second they come back, our the smartphone, the app recognizes that it's got Wi-Fi available because it connects to the trailer Wi-Fi. Right. It downloads all the camera data, uploads it to the Doxel cloud, and 24 to 48 hours later, Doxel's dashboard lights up, sends the, sends the superintendent's notifications saying, these are the areas you're ahead, these are the areas you're behind, and this is what you could potentially do about it. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we have got a phenomenal customer service and success team where if they see a really, really big problem, they'll call you right away. Or if they see a really big opportunity to accelerate because you're ahead in one area, they'll give you a call. Um, and we pride ourselves on that kind of customer service. So that's how the experience tends to be. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. No, right? that's perfect. I, in fact, I'm. it feels very minority report-ish, you know. Uh, this augmented reality where not only is it using the camera to collect this information and then you've got that back back office um, download process, evaluate through um, your tool and then um, and then give them a, a status report. But I love the opportunity to say, hey, look, it's, it's almost like the, um, you know, here's, a, here's the uh, opportunity to take advantage report, right? Here, here's where you're at on your target and what you engineered and where you're measuring. By the way, I mean, it's like a, it's like a Jarvis walking along with you. Um, by the way, you know, if you did, <clears throat> the, I can only imagine this is evolving, you know, f wherever it is today at some point, you know, if you just move that pile over there, you could improve your efficiency of trucks getting onto the site by 12 per or whatever. Just, you know, just that experienced person coming along and offering suggestions. Um, and and it, there may be a reason why you want, don't want to accelerate something, but it would be great to have that information and have it learning in this sort of this virtuous cycle of learning um, itself on the project. 100%. In fact, like early on, I actually named the customer, the pro, the company Weibo after the movie Flubber, you know, like Weibo <laughs> fly around with Robin Williams. I love Robin Williams. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but you know, the, an another story when you talk about kind of that optimization, we had another customer who was working on a very massive oil and gas facility. And they saw that um, four of their zones were ahead <clears throat> of schedule. And one of their zones was behind zone mm -hmm. five. And they couldn't figure out for, you know, they couldn't figure out why that was happening, right? Because they consistently saw that happening. And they used Oxel to slice and dice the data in different ways. And they basically said, hey, is this a trade problem? And then they were like, no, hold on a second. All of these trades are like, in general, they're doing very well in the other four zones. Mm -hmm. It's not a trade problem, right? Well, is it, um, is it something to do with um, this particular zone? Well, it certainly seems like it. Something's going on with this zone specifically. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that the taco truck was parked way too far from that zone. I mean, you're talking about an oil and gas campus, huge. And it turned out that the trades was, were walking front and back uh, um, about 0.3 miles to get tacos. And um, the, the, the taco truck was located closer to the, the other four zones. So one, they were spending a lot of time doing that walk. Two, it really impacted morale where they were like, what are you talking? I mean, I'm working out here in the cold and then I have to walk so far. Um, 
So they shifted the location to something that was a little bit more accessible and it actually solved the problem. <laughs> so That's incredible. We had almost, not the same thing, it wasn't tacos, but the same aha moment where um, we had a conversation years ago with a customer and we were being compared to another, we're trying to become the incumbent in a, a very large hyperscale, one of the largest IT buyers on earth. <clears throat> And one of the, th the the decision points came down to choosing us was in the detailed conversation. So you have the sort of here's the big idea. This is what we this is how we would host you. This is where we would do it, et cetera. In the minutia conversations with their operations team, with some of our logistics people, where they felt like we got them. This isn't a super secret sauce, but it's back to your point of details matter. Our freight elevators were located in a particular place in the data center because they have to ingest and remove infrastructure every single day. The restrooms were in a certain location that made it easy. Now, if you're 22, you don't care. If you're north of 35 and 40, everybody in that room, restroom location matters. The size of the doors, the, the path to and from, this was years of hard worn, you know, the cloud explosion of 08 and 2010 and whatever. And when we say we're building data centers at scale or any critical infrastructure, we're putting, you know, to your point about the construction time is one year of a 30, we're looking at 100 year buildings now, not, not 30 year, 100, 200 year buildings if that's possible. Um, but what that means is these environments are going to change over and over and over. And so the ability to have 100% up, but agile, you know, optimized for, for that um, infrastructure. But we forget many times about the infrastructure and the people that have to operate it that come and go into these spaces. And so to the degree that we can make somebody's life 2%, 3%, 5% better, you know, it is it is it is a compounding factor and those details matter. And uh, um, anyway, so I resonate with that kind of a story. It's a big deal. And you at least want the opportunity to do that evaluation. Like why is, are the people in zone five, you know, um, what is it that they have going on over these four zones? And to be able to have that aha moment, you're like, ah, oh. and then add it so you don't forget on future projects, we should do this. We should have something stored um, on site, or maybe it could be off site. We should have the food truck or whatever. All of these different components, you want them to be additive. So the net result of that, three years, five years, eight infrastructure later, I'm getting the cumulative benefit of all of these things. And I'm working on new things to get us even more efficient and our people more comfortable. We we're talking about labor shortage. Once I attract people to my organization, I don't want them to leave. I kind of want them to leave because the taco truck's closer on Tom's site than on Darwesh's site. I want them to stay at my site um, because it is, man, I don't know. It's just easier. You know, these all these little additive things, they're competitive advantages. And, you know, I'm so, it, that resonates like so much for me because like the best superintendents I know obsess over this thing called trade flow. Mm. Trade flow. They want to see, they will plan, hey, I want my sprinkler guys to go in. I want them to go from the northwest to the southeast corner, okay? And they're going to do zone one, two, three, four, five. Next, right behind them, depending on, you know, the, what what's going on with the job, they may have plumbing come in and mechanical right after that or so on and so forth. Um, and then they have really, really well orchestrated plans on making sure that every trade gets a window of time where they get to operate in that zone without another trade being there. Right. The reason why that matters is because if we go one layer uh, deeper, four men and four women, four persons, obsess over staging. They obsess over staging. So the best four persons I know who are in the field actually getting the work done, they they each have their own layout in their zone. I want the job boxes to be here. I want the tools to be here. I want the staging to be here. You get in, you place it here. They will mark the staging area. They will mark it. And what that leads to is this like assembly line almost. Mm. And I say assembly line 
as if it's easy to do, it's not easy to do. Because guess what? There's no assembly line. That's right. The chalk marks are the assembly line. Right. And it makes a huge difference because if you've got one trade that needs to operate in the same environment as another another trade, you could have like a two week delay very easily because they're not used to each other's layout, the job site layout. Uh, another another quick note on that: um, best superintendents I know are del- are upset when things are delayed, but they're equally upset when a trade goes rogue, when they get ahead and they go into a zone that they don't yet. Uh, they, they've not been authorized access to because right. it disrupts the trade flow, right. right? So all these things are things that component level progress tracking helps superintendents dominate, right? right? That's what that's what we're all about. We're about right. making them Batman, right? Because right? none of us were born Superman, but we can all become Batman with the right tools. Right. That's what it's about. Right. And and um, sort of in this theme of the best superintendents you know, when I see the superintendents that people really want to work for, when you can show up and say, explain to me why, and I can understand it, why I need to follow the flow, why I need to be where, and to let me know if there is a disruption of it. Because I don't want to be, you know, who wants a freaking bat boomerang up alongside the head? I want to do well. I want to, you know, I want to be successful at my job. I want an opportunity to um, accelerate. And, and so if you give the tools to that soup, to keep their people, you know, not like a taskmaster, but like a shepherd. I'm shepherding my flock to make sure they're where they need to be. They're out of danger. They're well fed. Everybody's moving along. I, you know, the original shepherds um, own their flock. To lose one of a hundred sheep is financial disaster. To lose two, don't come back because you can't pay your bills. Like you've got to protect the whole flock. And I know that's a kind of a, 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 an exaggerated example, but it's true. Like this, I, everybody has to be safe. I need to deliver it on time. I need it to be flow as efficiently as possible. And I need the opportunity to communicate. So I guess I got two questions for you. First of all, you mentioned oil and gas earlier. Some of the most interesting people I've met, I have a lot of family down in the Houston area, and they are either in the um, aerospace business uh, connected or they're in oil and gas. And what those groups have in common, at least, is they're used to being around complicated infrastructure, critical infrastructure, and their ability to project manage, their ability to um, to um, document and articulate to a wide variety of people, from a, a boardroom on Wall Street to a, a guy in his, uh, you know, jacket and boots out or gal out on the... Uh, um, shop floor is phenomenal. We need to seduce some of those people over to our our industry. A hundred percent. And in fact, oil and gas is um, something incredibly inspiring because if you look at even 20 years ago, <clears throat> oil and gas has been very, very rigorous about progress tracking right. uh, very early on. And the reason why, uh, I mean, they have these things called advanced work packaging and daily reports and things of that nature. The reason why um, is because oil and gas traditionally had a tremendous amount of complexity. Mm -hmm. And in general, the facilities have always been critical. Mm -hmm. So necessity is the mother of innovation, right? Mm -hmm. And there's another industry I know today, which is like that, which is data centers. Mm -hmm. Right, which is getting more and more complex, which is extremely critical. And I'm actually seeing a very healthy trend where I'm seeing folks from uh, project controls, which is this discipline of this rigorous tracking, come into the data center industry from oil and gas. Mm. And I think what that's going to do is um, really give the data center sector this capability to move faster, to move with more predictability. Um, into the future and address all of this demand that the oil and gas sector has experienced um, several times. I mean, it goes up and down, but when it booms, it booms, you right. know, in oil and gas. Right. Although what I've learned the hard way is they don't like you when you're talking about flammable fuel to say boom. Evidently, there's a... That's, they f- that's they f- great advice. <laughs> they that is sage that. advice. Great point. <laughs> uh, I am curious. We've talked about all of this stuff. Um, so, so let's say... I love all of this idea. The, 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 
information comes back from the cloud and says, you know, here status updates, how do they, I, you might have said it before when you talk about blueprints, but I might have missed it. How do they interact with this? Is it is it as complicated as, um, let, me, let me ask it differently, I guess. How simple can you make it so that even um, a new, um, you know, an inexperienced supervisor or, a, or a, a new manager that needs to communicate this needs to be able to interact and understand it. And yet I need the opportunity for it to be sophisticated so that when I'm having a conversation with the financiers or my customers or whatever, and I really do want it in a form that is um, rich and, and is communicating in a way that I'm used to interacting with it, what's the, the data that comes back explain what that looks like yeah absolutely i think that i think something that if we zoom out for a second something that's very very interesting about progress tracking mm -hmm. is progress is associated or connected with almost every action that's taken on a job site okay who do i pay when well i need to know what the progress is what do i do with my schedule when i need to know what the progress is how much labor do i need next week i need to know what the progress is when should my crane show up on site i need to know what the progress is right and because progress is attached to so many different things, including financiers who have to decide when to release a tranche of debt, right. there's a lot of demand in consuming progress data in different formats. So for example, four persons, superintendents want it in a 2D blueprint format, which is color coded, mm -hmm. right? And Doxel provides that in, in the interface. You hit one button, boom, it shows it to you. This is your life status. Green means done, blue means you know this stage, red means that stage, right. et cetera. Okay, let's talk about the VDC folks. The folks in VDC want that data in 3D. So Doxel allows them to use a um, very similar interface to BIM, except it's real time, mm. right? It's real time BIM for them, where it's color coded and sliding up based on what the camera is seeing. Boop, 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 boop. The folks who are at HQ, typically want to see graphs and charts, which uh, Doxel also provides. I often hear VPs of construction saying, I literally want to see two lines, which Doxel, by the way, provides. One showing my plan schedule, one showing the actual, and then just tell me how we're going to hit it, mm -hmm. right? So, and then we also see um, schedulers uh, want to go five, six clicks deeper than that and want to view Gantt charts. Mm -hmm. And one of the inherent capabilities that we built is the capability to slice and dice this data in several ways so that everyone can get value from this extremely rich progress data. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I think people underestimate sometimes because if you assume that providing the full level of detail is going to make the information valuable, it's literally the opposite. Right. You have to meet the person who's using the tool in the format that they're already used to seeing that information without changing their workflow, even a smidge, mm -hmm. even a smidge. And that's what we really, really took to heart. Um, and we've just enriched the same workflows that folks already have. Schedulers see their data uh, or can see their data in Gantt charts from us. Uh, financiers can see it in the form of line, line charts. Superintendents and four persons can see it in a visual format. Um, and of course, folks can access the photos themselves if they so wish. Um, so that's like been a counterintuitive insight uh, several years ago when we were beginning out here. But um, just seeing the traction, I can tell you it's because it's so simple <clears throat> to use and it, flexible. <clears throat> you know, I, I, not to compare it to the military or even to Uber. You mentioned Uber earlier, but they jumped to my mind. <clears throat> what those two organizations are really good at is providing clarity. I need to be able to onboard people. Um, make them operationally effective quickly in a why you know a customer gets involved my buddy John trout over at checkup talks about this mm -hmm. um, how do I ingest people um, un help them to understand what it is that we're trying to do and at their simplest level <coughs> excuse me they have an expectation of an outcome so if I'm a if I'm ordering a car service I have this simple to understand app I want to be picked up here. I want to be delivered here. The driver gets information. They understand it. The rider gets information. They understand it. They understand what their commitment is to each other about the time commitment, about the route, all these other things. And they don't need really much more information than that. And they're, they're meeting their expectations or any ride service. I'm not trying to pick a winner or loser here. 
But then on the back office, you know the people on the back end are evaluating how long did somebody have the app open before they chose a car? Which of the services, on and on and on without belaboring it. There's so much information there. And with the military, you know, the, the commanders, the generals have the big idea and they pass it down the line until it eventually ends up to a soldier or an airman or a seaman or whoever. And they know their role to play and they have enough of their view to accomplish their mission, to do their job. But if you gave them three or four or five levels up, they probably, it'd be too much information. It's not applicable for me to help my teammate to my right and to my left and to accomplish those things in front of me. It's enough, but, but more than that, um, it, it's just going to get in the way of trying to accomplish something. And so I love the idea of I have enough information. I have the opportunity to go get more depending upon my role, but I have enough information to be effective at what it is that's in front of me. That's a, that's a great idea. And it really unites the field room uh, to the boardroom, right? Like, you, and you need that communication to move up and down. Like, sometimes the field needs to talk to the board and say, hey, guys, this design change is going to impact our schedule in this way. This right. line chart is going to move from here to there. Right. Eventually, what's going to happen with all of this data that's available is um, eventually there's going to be a chat interface, <clears throat> right, that everyone has where they can just ask questions, right? Like, right. what are my most at risk opportunity? What, what are my most at risk areas this week? Hmm. Where am I behind? Where can I get ahead? Um, what actions can I take over the course of the next month to get back on track? Um, like Jarvis, right? That's right. eventually going to happen. And um, that's the ultimate form of data accessibility. And the great news is that interface already exists today, right? With large language models and all that, chat, mm -hmm. GPT, et cetera. The tough thing which we're solving is getting the data from the field, converting that imagery into data and turning it into all these flexible streams, which right. people can use to unlock the insights that they need um, to truly gain alignment. Right. Um, and if we didn't have that, it would actually lead to information asymmetry, right? Because Doxel is this amazing tool and we wanna make sure that everybody has access to it. Well, we've talked a lot today and uh, I can't even believe I was just glancing down at the time we are coming up to time what is a key takeaway from the industry in general, Doxel specifically? What's, what's, what I, I am amused about, um, Rob, is normally when we have guests on our show, I'm like, this is not an infomercial for me or for you. Let's just have, and I have, this has not been an infomercial. It's just been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, what do you want to make sure people take away as they listen to this? And then I guess the second part of that question, where can they go to find out more, maybe to challenge you or question some of the things that we've talked about today? Awesome. So I think I think my biggest takeaway, having worked in this industry and having seen the kind of courageous decisions that I've seen superintendents <clears throat> take, take and I've, you know, seeing those decisions pay off, I think my biggest takeaway is that people can be absolutely superhuman with the right tools. Right. right. Just like Batman. None of us are born Superman, but everybody can become Batman right. with the right tools. That's been very, very inspiring to see. Much like a military general who needs to call some shots based on situational awareness. So that's been inspiring for me. Mm -hmm. uh, where can people go to, to learn more about Doxel? Um, 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 Doxel.ai, that's that's where I suggest you all go. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a phenomenal customer service and customer facing team that would be Delighted to chat with you if, mm -hmm. uh, if that's something you'd like to do. And how can you challenge us? Well, just give us a call and mm -hmm. uh, feel free to hit us with any questions that you have. Intellectual honesty is a value at our company. We value it very dearly. And we would love the opportunity to interact with anyone who's interested in adopting progress tracking on their projects. Well, not only have I so enjoyed this conversation, I have enjoyed every time I've heard you speak either online or in person I'm so grateful for you for coming on and giving me a lot to uh, think about and talk to my operations teams uh, about. Um, and if we didn't make it clear earlier, you're the CEO of Doxel, is that correct? That, that That's right. And and David, honestly, the uh, the honor is mine. I'm really excited to be, I'm, I'm really excited to have had the opportunity to chat with you. We've met offline on yeah. the circuit at trade shows and stuff, but 
um, this conversation has been really amazing. It felt a little bit like being in my living room, uh, which is. <laughs> I <laughs> which feel bad is, for your living room. <laughs> uh, my living room's amazing. So that's a that's a that's a compliment. Uh, um, but yeah, thank you, thank you so much for uh, for having us. It's my great pleasure. And hey, look, if you enjoyed that conversation, like, and if you loved it, subscribe. We'll see you next time, everybody. Have a good one. 